I do welcome everyone back again this morning. Uh, it's always a little odd to me because I always welcome the church that's here, and then I turn the video on and we welcome everybody that's out there. And who knows where you are, what time you're watching this, uh, but I pray that the message and the timing of all of this will be perfect for your life and that God will be able to touch you in our time together. It is always a blessing uh, to be with one another. OGFMC is our website. Check it out. Um, you can find a lot of really neat things there. And we have a Facebook page and we can supply you with a lot of information and a lot of devotionals and Bible studies. If you, if you need more information, click on the link. Uh, we will be in contact with you. We are in our fourth week of our sermon series, Better, and I have a, an unusual question, and this isn't for my benefit, this is for yours, but how many of you over the last three weeks feel like you are getting better in your walk and in your relationship with God? How many? Yes. God talks to us works through us, teaches us things that are way beyond our understanding at times. We have to take them by faith, don't we? So God has given us the opportunity to share his love with the world. And in order to do so, we must always be ready to give witness, to give witness to Jesus through his word and through his deeds. We can either give him a good name or be the reason that someone would reject having a relationship with the Lord. That's a frightening thought, isn't it? We can either be the reason that someone wants to know more about God, or we become an advertisement that says this is nothing that you want to have anything to do with. And that sounds brutal, but it's true. Our life and our walk what we do, what we say, how we interact, all of those things play an important part on how the gospel is presented to a world that needs God so very desperately. Let's pray. Lord, we ask that you would give us grace and give us confidence to share your good news with others, not just this week, but for this year. Let our lives tell the story of your love and your kindness. Bring the people into our community that you want us to witness to. Help us, O oh God, to be led by your Spirit, to be touched in so many ways that our lives can be a faithful witness to all that you have done, will do, and are doing. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Each week of this series, um, we've really tried to highlight some, some way, some portion of a relationship with Jesus that can make our lives better. I trust that you are closer to God today than you were yesterday. I trust that you will be not as close today as you are going to be tomorrow. It is a growth time between you and God. Fully submitting to Christ opens us up to the transforming power of God. It's not about what we do. It's about what God does within us. Now, over the last three weeks, we've looked at several things. The first week, we looked at the impact that God can have on our lives when we begin the new year with better priorities. Now, it's hard to believe that we're talking about the beginning of the year, and January's already gone, we're halfway through February already, but it's still the beginning of a new year. When we put God first, the rest of our lives fall into order. If we get it backwards, the most important things in our lives are going to suffer. Not may, but will suffer if we get that backwards. Two weeks ago, we discovered that the people we surround ourselves with will have far-reaching effects. Sometimes it's important for us to focus on having better relationships to experience the life that God has for us. So we've, we looked at 
at who we witness to, who we spend time with. And then last week, we considered how a connection to Jesus can help us make better choices. We are largely the choices that we make. And as we go through this year, perhaps we need to operate with more godly wisdom. More godly wisdom. Does that mean that we, that we get the wisdom of God and all of a sudden we're all knowing? No, it's we are relying upon God's wisdom and interaction and inter, intersections in our life. So today we're going to finish this series by being challenged to live this year as a better witness. Now I shared with you a little bit, um, you know, the some of the needs of our of our kids and and all of you have. Yeah, I mean you have kids. You know what it's like to raise kids. Uh, sometimes they're a real blessing, and at other times you say, "Why didn't I just get a dog?" <laughs> right? or a goat. You know, goats will eat anything. They'll follow you anywhere. They're pretty easy going, but sometimes we, we look at our family and we look at our kids and we say, you know, you do the best that you can and you can't fix it, right? You cannot fix their problems, but what you can do is turn it over to God and pray that somehow God is going to interject himself into their lives. But when, uh, when our kids were small, there were times, that those of you that had more than one child in the home, there were those times, correct me if I'm wrong, that you needed a witness. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. You needed a witness. Now, once in a while, prop probably never happened in your families, but once in a while a child does something and let's just say something gets broken. Let's just say something gets broken. And you're usually not present when it happens. And when you come into the room after the sound of the crash and you see people there, little people there, the question comes up, what happened? Do you ever get this reaction? Right? They just shrug their shoulders. Well, I don't know. I don't know. Well, our youngest daughter, Ashley, happened to be the individual at that time I say that with a smile on my face. At that time, <coughs> was the most honest. Being an adult, creative rephrasing comes in from time to time. <laughs> but when I really needed to get to the facts, I'd go directly to her and I'd ask her. Because I knew that she wouldn't lie to me and that she would tell the truth. You ever have that experience? I love it when our kids get together because you get to hear the stories of things that happened that you weren't aware of when they happened, right? My oldest son told me one time, he says, you know, he says, growing up was different with you, Dad. He says, there were times that he says, I got my, he said, butt, got my butt whipped for something that I didn't do. But, he said, on the other hand, there were times that the other kids got whipped for something that I did. And he said, I figured it all balances out in the end anyway. But what good is a good witness? A witness is someone who gives evidence in relation to matters of fact that are under inquiry. Maybe you've been a witness to a traffic accident, had to give your statement of what you saw or experienced, Maybe you've been a witness to a historical event that you've shared with others over the years. Maybe you actually had to serve on a trial jury. I have no idea. But in any case, a witness is always a person of utmost importance when it comes to the fact and how things 
really are. Would you agree? So the Bible talks about witnesses, not in the ways mentioned above, but instead witnesses to the power of the crucified and resurrected Jesus. You see, as a follower of Jesus, we are commanded to be a witness. It's not a suggestion. It's kind of like the Ten Commandments. Those aren't suggestions either. But we are commanded to be a witness for Christ. It's not an option. And in fact, it is the final instruction that Jesus gives his disciples before he ascended into heaven. That's what he told them. Now, if you're getting ready to take a trip, and let's just say you're, you're going someplace where you're probably not ever going to be back home again, and you have an opportunity to give some parting words, aren't you going to pick your words very carefully and make sure that it is the most important thing that you could share? That's exactly what Jesus did. He told his disciples to be a witness. So God teaches us the fundamental job of a Christian is to be a witness. Being a Christian in its simplest form is living out and sharing with others what Jesus has done in our life. It is offering up evidence from your own experience that would validate that Jesus is who he said he is. And before you sit there and say, well, but sometimes don't, things don't go the best. Sometimes I get things all messed up and God's got to bail me out. What kind of a testimony is that? It is a perfect testimony. Because you know what? We've all been there. And God forgives and God restores and God encourages and he teaches us. Those are not things to shy away from but say, look, I made a mistake and God fixed it. I gave it to him. I'm not carrying that burden around. The book of Acts, chapter 1, verses 6, 7, and 8, speaks to this mandate that was for Jesus' followers then and for his followers that were yet to come. We are included in this. Acts chapter 1, beginning with verse 6. Here's what it says. So when the apostles were with Jesus, they kept asking him, Lord, has the time come for you to free Israel and restore our kingdom? He replied, the Father alone has the authority to set those dates and times, and they are not for you to know. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. My goodness. That's a, that's a big mandate, isn't it? Or a big promise. You want to look at it as a mandate? Or do you want to look at it as a promise? Because he says, here it is. You're going to receive power, and here's what I want you to do with it. So Jesus tells these followers that they're going to receive a helper, meaning you're not going to have to rely upon your own strength, and that that spirit will empower them to be his witnesses. Then he tells them that they are to share it with people everywhere. There's an interesting Greek word here for witness that is martis. Martis can actually be translated as martyr. Now, none of us would run out and say, well, you know, go ahead and kill me. But we give our lives. It doesn't mean that we've lost them. It doesn't mean that we are slain in the way that we would traditionally think of someone who is martyred for their faith. But it is a word that shows up throughout the book of Acts as early Christians demonstrated their faith to Christ to others, even by giving up their lives. Some of them, their lives were taken from them. They didn't just give their lives in service. Some of them were put to death because of their faith. When Jesus references the Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth, we tend to think that he's just picking things on a map until you look at it on a map and you see that Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. 
It's an expanding circle. And that spoke to me when I, when I thought of that, I realized it, pondered on it. The circle of our life is ever expanding. Do you know that? Because you meet people new every day. You meet somebody new every day. And it would be so interesting if we, if we had a way of being able to put all of our names on a board and then we draw a circle and in that circle we put the names of people that we know. Just right around the circle. And then we start comparing our circle to someone else's circle and you'll find that there will be many times where circles overlap and two people have the same person in their sphere of influence. Do you know that's by divine design? <laughs> when Jesus says, Jerusalem, Samaria, Judea, the uttermost parts of the earth, my goodness, he's saying your circle is going to expand there's no place on earth that we are not meant to be advocates for and examples of the powerful results of living a life that is submitted to the leadership and love of Jesus. The difference that it makes. There are currently many things that Jesus wants us to do in response to his grace and his forgiveness. We read the Bible. We talk about that nearly every week. I do hope that you take time to read the Word of God, spending time in prayer, going to church. See, looky there. Easy. You've checked one off. If you've got this checklist, you can say, yep, made that one. Did I read the Bible today? Not yet, but I will when I get home. Uh, have I prayed today? Uh, not yet, but I will when I get home. So you're already part way there, just being in fellowship this morning. But the most basic response to faith in Jesus is to look for any way possible that we might be able to tell someone about him. Now I know that that sounds daunting and frightening to say, I want you, oh God, to show me a way that I can talk to somebody about my faith in you. That takes a lot of boldness and it takes a lot of faith to be able to say that. To share what God is doing in your life. Through word and deed, we need to be witnesses to his love, to his mercy, the sacrifice that he made, the hope that he gives, the power that he supplies. We must be careful not to become so removed from the world that it is in need of healing and restoration. And we don't see that need and don't respond. If someone tripped and fell in front of you, what would you do? Wouldn't you go over to them and ask them if they're okay? Are you all right? Can I help you up? Uh, did you break anything? Is there anything I can get you? Is there anything that you need? We would do that immediately if we saw somebody fall in front of us. I've got news for you. We have people around us every day that are fallen and they need a hand up. They need a word of encouragement. They need somebody that can come alongside them and say, how can I help? How can I pray for you? How can I uplift you? So I want us to look at 1 Peter chapter 3. You got to love Peter. I mean, he, here's a guy that doesn't pull any punches. 1 Peter 3, 15 and 16. Instead, you must worship Christ as Lord of your life. And if someone asks you about your hope as a believer, always be ready to explain it. But do this in a gentle and respectful way. Keep your conscience clear. Then if people speak against you, they will be ashamed when they see what a good life you live because you belong to Christ. Wow. There is a story told of D.L. Moody. In one of his meetings, a man once testified that he had lived 
on the Mount of Transfiguration for five years. Lived on the Mount of Transfiguration. That's where uh, Moses and Elijah appeared to Jesus. I mean, it's, it's an actual physical place in the Holy Land. This guy lived on the Mount of Transfiguration for five years as if to brag about his piety, Moody says. Moody asked him, how many souls did you lead to Christ last year? Well, the man hesitated. I don't know. Have you saved any? Moody persisted. I don't know that I have, the man admitted. Well, says Moody, we don't want that kind of mountaintop experience. When a man gets up so high that he cannot reach down and save poor sinners, there's something wrong. There's something wrong. So maybe we need to challenge ourselves to live with a better witness. We need to commit to giving evidence to the love of Christ by what we say and do to and for people, both near and far. Secondly of all, God teaches us that we are the light of the world. Now, sometimes... Sometimes we don't have a lot of wattage. We, uh, we <laughs> when I was in seminary, we used to have a, a term that we used, and you'll see the humor in it here in just a moment. We see somebody that's really struggling and just having a hard time comprehending and, and really doing what they need to be doing, and we'd say, yep, he's a real dim bulb. He's a real dim bulb. There are other places in the gospel where Jesus talks about what it means to be a witness. In fact, in the middle of his most famous sermon, Jesus tells his followers that they have a very important job to do, that they are to be a light in the darkness. So let's look at Matthew 5, verses 14, 15, and 16. He says, you are the light of the world. Like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden, no one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. <coughs> Have you ever heard? Thought about how important it is to have light? <laughs> it, it really is a good thing. If we pulled the curtain at the back of the, the entryway here and closed off and turned off all the lights, it gets pretty dark in here. Those of you that were here for the candlelight Christmas Eve service know exactly what I'm talking about. Without it, Everything is dark. Things become very difficult to accomplish and very difficult to make out and to see. Visiting a cave in Tennessee, having them turn out the lights. I was there. <laughs> it's interesting when you're in a cave and they say, now everybody just stand still, don't be moving around. I'm going to turn out the lights. And they turn out the lights in the cave and they say, now, put your hand in front of your face. You can't see anything. It's absolute darkness. They really didn't think that it was all that funny when I growled like a wildcat when the lights went out. <laughs> I got up one night. The house was dark. And as Usually you do when you're, when you're walking and trying to feel your way, you're going like this, right? I learned a new way to do that. Like this. Because if you go like this, you can straddle a door. <laughs> Bedroom door came up to meet me right between the eyes. And it doesn't swing very well when you hit it on the edge. Oh. 
keep that in mind. No extra charge. The importance and the significance of Jesus' words to the disciples would have been very clearly understood by people of the day. If they wanted light, it had to be either daytime or they had to light something. They didn't just walk over and flip a switch. Or as Emily would say, cut on the light. Or cut off the light. It's a North Carolina thing. Never really have understood it, but that's North Carolina. You gotta love North Carolina, right? Right? Yes, yes. <laughs> These people had to have a torch, a lamp, a candle, or something similar. Light was a precious thing, and it was never taken for granted. When Jesus was born into our world, he came into the midst of darkness. He came to a people who were full of sin and darkness. He was the only source of true light for their soul. The witness of his life says, you know what it's like to be in the dark. You know how even a small light can change everything? This is what I've, I have come to do, Jesus says. And when you place your faith, hope, and trust in me, you now have the same light that originates with me living inside of you. The same light. Jesus tells them a city on a hill could not be hidden. You see, in the, in the hill country of Galilee, most, if not all, cities and towns were located on the top of a hill. And there was a reason for that. It made them safe from invasion. It also made it extremely visible, especially at night. And the placement of these cities was important because when someone was traveling in the dark, it was easily seen from afar off as the only place that light would be present at night. You could see safety and shelter. You could see hope on the horizon because it was off in the distance. It was lifted up and you could see it. These people understood. But the question is, do we understand that we are a light to the world to illuminate darkness and light the way for others? Do you know our lives point to Christ? Are we lifted up? Are, are, is our life an example of people to aspire to a life of faith? As important as light in the darkness is, you are just as important in a world that is lost in the dark. Lastly, God teaches us not to be ashamed. One of the greatest challenges to living as a better witness is a few of these. And I don't want to frighten you, but let's try this first one on. The fear of what others might think about our relationship with Jesus. What are people going to say if they know that I'm a Christian or if I'm giving a testimony? Some of us might be embarrassed. Some of us might be ashamed. Some of us might be timid about boldly living out our Christian convictions. We're, we're hesitant. The Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 1 says this, For I am not ashamed of this good news about Christ. It is the power of God at work, saving everyone who believes, the Jew first and also the Gentile. This good news tells us how God makes us right in his sight. This is accomplished from start to finish by faith. As the scriptures say, it is through faith that a righteous person has life. <laughs> Don't be ashamed. Don't be silenced. Don't hide your faith. The power of God is with us to strengthen us and to give us the words to share the good news of Jesus with those that he brings into our path. A fellow by the name of Leighton Ford writes in his book that he wrote, Good News is for Sharing. It's a neat book. These questions are those that we could ask ourselves whenever we become 
fearful. Number one, when I am conscious of the fear of failure holding me back, I go through a kind of personal checklist, he says. Does this fear come basically from pride? A fear that I will not live up to my own, expectation, my own expectations or those of others? It's a good question to ask. Do I remember that God has called me first to faithfulness, then to efficiency? Do I trust that the Holy Spirit is working before me, with me, and through me? Another good question. Do I remember that I am called to be neither more or less successful than Jesus Christ was? Do I remember that God does his greatest work when I seem to be at my weakest? Isn't that, after all, the witness of the cross, he says? Good thoughts. Good questions. And I don't know about you, but I read those and I say, I've been there. Those questions apply to me. Should I have been asking those questions a little more pointed of myself? So closing this out this morning, we hold in our hearts the good news of Jesus Christ. We, we possess that. The good news is that because of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, our lives can be transformed and made new. We have experienced forgiveness. We have experienced hope, joy. We are witnesses. But we must overcome our fear to share with a world that is in great need. The gospel needs to be shared. So here's a question for you to take with you. Who is one person in your life that you can be a witness to? Just one. I'm not asking you to write a list. Just one person in your life that you could be a witness to? What is one thing that you can do to be a better witness to the world around you? Starting out a new year, we call upon ourselves to look for opportunities, to be an advocate for Christ. This is the calling on our lives and the imperative command that Christ left us with the truth is, we will have a better year if we focus on better priorities, better relationships, better choices. It will make us a better witness. Let's pray. Almighty God, we thank you again for the faithfulness of your word. This is spoken to us. And everyone in this place and those that are watching this video know full well the areas of their life that maybe they need to take a little bit of an inventory to say, Lord, how do you want to correct my trajectory in my life? How do you want to correct the course that I'm on? How can I be a faithful witness to you? And who, O oh Lord, could you lay upon my heart would you help me to see them? Would you help me to hear them? And would you give me the opportunity to reach out to them with this good news? Help me, O oh Lord, to have the words to say and the opportunities to say them. You tell us that you are going to make us faithful witnesses. Lord, we believe that that is exactly what you'll do. And so we are trusting in your intervention in our life and ask that you would use our lives as a beacon light to those around us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
See you. 